to answer the question. So, Aubrey, it's, it's your turn. Thanks very much, Bill. We'll uh, see if I can uh, share the screen, screen, screen correctly. There we go. Um, okay, so I'm going to be doing most of the talking, as Bill said, because Don's run into some technical difficulties, but he's online with us, and I expect he'll chime in if I get too far astray. I'll bring uh, your notes are up. The presentation. I'll bring your I'd notes like are to... up there, so you may want to cancel out your notes first. Okay, hang on a sec. That's okay. We got, we got to the... remove them. How's that? Uh, not oh, yet. Yeah. Not yet? How's okay, that? My technical advisors give you. There we are. We're all go. set. Okay. So, um, as I said, uh, I'm going to do most of the chatting. Before I get started in the presentation, I just want to give a shout out to uh, Bill Williams, who's on the Zoom call today. Uh, he's watching from his hospital bed. And I uh, just want to say to Bill, uh, Keep believing in the uh, power of positive thinking, Bill. Uh, we're with you. So in the next 15 minutes or so, we're going to describe uh, a consumer promotion that ran for 35 years in Canada and was instrumental in the development of professional hockey. In January of 1934, the Sonora Starch Company of Port Credit, Ontario, began a mail-in consumer promotion that connected to their new radio advertising campaign. The promotion was so successful that it would continue for the next 35 years. But still, it begs the question, how did a promotion by a small, and a very small, Canadian corn syrup manufacturer gain an important place in hockey history? As I said earlier, the promotion was offered only in Canada and concluded during the 1967-68 season. So there may be quite a few people in our viewing audience today uh, that are not familiar with the promotion. It was comprised of 1,025 pictures, uh, all NHL players, although they were never all available at one time. The most that was offered in any one season was during the 1939-40 season uh, at the beginning of World War II, when 185 were available. The pictures were larger than what had been sporadically made available by the tobacco companies and other confectionery companies, um, and they were uh, approximately uh, four by seven uh, sheets. They were printed uh, black and white on uh, five by eight backers. And uh, they were accompanied by a suggestion from St. Lawrence Starts that they were suitable for framing. So they were trying to be a little bit more upscale than the traditional uh, trading card. Packaging labels from all of the St. Lawrence Starts brands were eligible for redemption. But their most popular brand, Beehive Golden Corn Syrup, uh, was uh, the one that stood out, and hence the promotion came to be known by that name. The promotion itself had just amazing, powerful appeal across all of Canada. It's really difficult for us today to imagine how popular that promotion was. Uh, one of the best ways for us to illustrate it, to understand the importance of the promotion, is to consider the, the, the total number of hockey books that are written and to observe the number of times that the Beehive promotion is referenced. And I'm gonna give you three examples just to show how popular it was. The first one's about Gordie Howe. Uh, there's been several books written about Gordie Howe, arguably, arguably the, the greatest hockey player of all time. Mm -hmm. And in every book, he is always mentioned about collecting Beehive hockey pictures. In his authorized autobiography called And How, he stated, they used to have B.I. corn syrup, and I collected the labels. If you sent away for them, you would get a picture of the hockey player of your choice. They were nice pictures, and a pretty good size, about six by four. I'd say I did pretty well collecting those labels out of people's garbage uh, cans on my delivery route. With only 120 players in the league, I had 180 pictures. Later in the same book, he went on to say, 
when we made our first trip to Toronto, the guy who used to take the photos for the Beehive Corn Syrup card had me pose for my very first card. While I was there, I looked around and I asked, if this were still apps and those guys have their pictures taken? He replied, yes. And I said, then you won't have to ask me to smile. So Beehive was a big part of Gordy Howe's life. The promotion also had powerful appeal to players who would not be superstars. superstars. Uh, Billy Harris was representative of uh, the average NHL hockey player. In his biography, The Glory Years, he stated, some athletes don't really believe that they are pros until they see their photo on a bubblegum card. For us, it didn't really sink in until we became a member of the Beehive Collection. So we concluded that Harris must have been pretty delighted to have appeared not once, but in four unique Beehive pictures during his career. The third example is about Harley Hotchkiss. Now Hotchkiss is not a household name, even among the most fervent hockey fans uh, and historians. He was a, a part owner of the Calgary Flames, and for 12 years he was the chairman of the NHL Board of Governors. In his biography, he wrote about his useful passion for Beehive hockey pictures, and his favorite player, uh, Maple Leaf centerman and captain Silas. On Saturday nights, my sister Mary and I perched in front of the radio, often joined by dad. I don't think I ever missed a game in following the fate of Toronto, especially still up with his hawk eyes and shock of thick dark hair. Aside from seeing him once in person on the ice during the 30s, I knew what he looked like from the hockey cards I got free by collecting labels of Beehive Golden Corn Syrup and sending them in to the St. Lawrence Starch Company to port credit. Because we made our own maple syrup, my mom wouldn't buy, buy the store-bought corn variety. I had to convince my brother Jack and his wife to save beehive labels and box tops of other St. Lawrence products and get into town myself to find more in the dump. So pretty common theme between Hotchkiss and Hoff. John and I found referenced over in over 20 hockey books uh, to the beehive promotion. And it seems that every major writer, including Scott Young, Milk Dunnell, Frank Orr, and even chair member Dave Stubbs have uh, penned a column of the, about the Beehive hockey promotion over the years. But a few anecdotes don't uh, tell the whole story. So it's helpful to consider the era that gave rise to the promotion. Um, the economy was a disaster. The Great Depression started in 1929, and it was much more than a stock market crash. Inevitably, the NHL really struggled uh, during those years of the Depression and in the run up to World War II. At that time, sports revenue was almost entirely based on getting fans in the stands. Radio was still uh, at a very early stage, as we uh, know from Andrew's presentation. And from a paper prepared by Sir member Andrew Ross, we learned that it was in January of 1933 that the first national radio network was established. And there was 20 uh, stations that went together and they carried the Maple Leaf games across Canada on Saturday night. Telephone tests that were done in February of that year showed an audience of just under a million listeners. Incredibly, there was just over 500,000 radio receivers in all of Canada at that time. And something that I didn't know is that you had to get a government license in order to be able to own a radio. In all, 14 Leaf games were broadcast that first year nationally. And it's important to note that the urban dwellers would have relied as well as radio on local newspapers. Um, but for most of Canada, it was still rural, 45% rural, 20% now. So it's really changed. So much of Canada had very sparse media access. For an additional perspective of how the NHL struggled during the Depression, just look at team franchises. The uh, Pittsburgh Pirates, they folded after the 29-30 season. The team was revived as the Philadelphia Quakers, but they only last one season, and it folded in 1931. The Ottawa Senators had been struggling before the Depression. It suspended operations for one season, and it came back, but eventually it migrated to St. Louis, 
where it became the Flyers for the 1933-34 season, and it folded after only that one season. The Montreal Canadiens experienced a very lackluster attendance, and they were rumored to be moving to Cleveland. Imagine if that had happened. One exception to the rule was the Toronto Maple Leafs, which were aggressive with their marketing and their broadcast initiatives. And as luck would have it, the Maple Leafs won the Stanley Cup in 1932. Consumers needed a really good feel-good story to help lift them out of depression, economically and emotionally. The building of Maple Leafs Gardens in a very short time and the subsequent winning of the Stanley Cup by English Canada's team served as a very strong catalyst. This gave rise to an unparalleled level of promotional activity. 1933-34 saw the introduction of five sets of trading cards impacted by chewing gum companies. They were called Canadian, Hamilton, Otici, Worldwide, and a manufacturer who, amazingly enough, their identity has been lost over time. This set is now known to collectors just as the anonymous set. As well, an American chewing gum uh, brand, uh, Gaudi, also included a few uh, hockey cards in their Sports King set of cards. So this was unprecedented amount of promotional coverage. As we noted, radio was still very much in its early stages. I'll just go back a, a few years, 1925, Ted Rogers had introduced the innovative battery, battery less radio, which operated on standard home wiring. Before that, they had to have great big batteries to support the radio, and uh, they, not many people could afford them. But being uh, running on regular uh, electricity, it opened up potential for much greater home ownership and therefore radio ownership. Rogers radio station, CFRB, aired on February 19th of 1927. That was the same year that West Knight moved to CFRB as program director, and he introduced Canada's first daily sports program called Sports New, a few years later, 1930. Foster Hewitt went national two years later with his hockey podcast and became synonymous with English language hockey broadcasts throughout English Canada. Today, the night is not as well remembered, but he was very central to hockey uh, radio broadcasts uh, as a panelist in the early hot stove intermission discussions. And for over two decades, he served as the on-air yeah, spokesperson for St. Lawrence Church as a result of their sponsorship of his daily sports broadcasts, which was syndicated and broadcast in Saturday uh, immediately before the Hockey Night in Canada broadcast. By the way, these two gentlemen both appeared uh, with uh, Beehive pictures uh, that are shown here on the screen. No NHL coach or executive appeared on the Beehive, but these two media personalities uh, certainly did. Important as well to note that Canadian radio content was dominated by American shows. The major exception was news and sports broadcasts. To give you a sense of how popular radio broadcasts of hockey had become, had become by uh, February of 1934, research uh, showed that 74% of all radios that were on Saturday night were listening to the General Motors hockey broadcast. Now, some of you will know that that was the precursor to hockey night in Canada. So Lord Starch could not afford to advertising like General Motors and Imperial Oil could, uh, so they uh, initiated sponsorship of Big Night uh, Sports Broadcast to sort of tag on to what was a, a very growing uh, popular program. Before that, uh, St. Lawrence Starch had really uh, directed most of their advertising to retailers <laughs> and wholesalers. Uh, and they had some very uh, modest consumer ads in newspapers. What we've shown here on the screen are uh, some scribblers that they handed out at places like the CNE the Canadian National Exhibition and at Fall Fair. And the two small signs on the right are uh, in-source signs for the corn starch and beehive corn syrup uh, before 1934. <coughs> Interestingly, Opichi utilized the same ad agency as the similar starch company. It wasn't Vickers and Benson. Uh, it was a company known as McLaren and Ferguson, no relationship. Uh, and their uh, account representative, Jim Coots, convinced St. Lawrence Starch to become 
more aggressive in promoting their product. The only way they get out of the, the depression was to advertise and to be aggressive. That was his argument. Accordingly, they signed on as a sponsor of Sports Views, not as a sponsor, as the sponsor of Sports Views in May of 1933. It sought ways of leveraging McKnight's interviews with the Maple Leaf players and the management staff. Coots uh, obviously knew of the success of Opeachy's impact hockey card promotion, and he refashioned the concept for St. Lawrence Starch to be a free gift picture in exchange for a Beehive product label. Consumers were married, made aware of the offer exclusively on McKnight's uh, sports broadcast for the first couple of years, and soon the promotion became more important than the radio sponsorship in driving sales of beehive corn syrup. The promotion began in the, the winter, um, January of 1934, with four Maple Leaf uh, star players, the kid line of Jackson, Primo, and Conacher, plus defenseman King Clancy. These players were among the nine Leaf that were interviewed in the first quarter of 1934, on CFRB Saturday night broadcast, and uh, that appeared just before the game. They were obviously taped and, and uh, played um, just before the game, and uh, so that's how those four were selected. Uh, an additional six players from Montreal, uh, three from each team were selected, so there was 10 pictures available that first year. Uh, the Canadian players were Aral Joliet, Silvo Mantha, Pip Latine, the Maroons were Jimmy Ward, Alex Connell and Cy Wentworth. Now, to many of us are hockey fans, we may have heard of them. Uh, other than maybe Joliet, uh, uh, there, there wasn't a lot of big names there, at least not names that have lasted over the, over the years. So you may have noticed in that that two of the leading stars of that day, Howie Marin and Lionel Conacher, were surprisingly not included. And that's because originally the, the ad agency negotiated rights to use the player's images directly with each player. And we, Don and I have concluded that these two stars asked more of St. Lawrence Starch than they were prepared to uh, incur. So a picture of Marin was eventually issued later when he returned to Montreal in 1936 after he'd been exiled to Chicago, New York. Um, but Although Conacher appears in a one ad, and it's, it's shown here, it's, uh, he's shown there as a football player, and he was promoting his professional football team in Toronto, um, and so he agreed to appear uh, in an ad, and, but he never appeared in a Beehive hockey picture. In 1934, the NHL adopted a standard player contract that conferred the player's promotional rights to the teams. It appeared that that agreement, although reached in 34, was not implemented by Toronto until 1936. And it was that year that St. Lawrence Starch gained exclusive rights to the Maple Leaf players for the corn starch and the syrup market at a cost of $4,750. $4,750, that was to have the players, their, their images, their signatures, and they would appear on the promotional events with McKnight. And that, that price, $4,750, remained unchanged until 1962, when one of the new owners, Harold Ballard, who was part of the cash strap trio, uh, not surprisingly turned his attention to promotional activity and particularly this agreement. The mention of the pictures being available uh, was not included in any print media uh, until newspaper advertising ran in March of 1935. And so that was a, over a year after the promotion ran, uh, the promotion began rather. Um, even then it was pretty much an afterthought. If you are able to squint at the bottom three lines, which are printed in most type, included a reference uh, to the promotion in this ad that features uh, Lionel Conacher's younger brother, Charlie Conacher. So despite somewhat backing into the promotion, it proved to be very successful for St. Lawrence Starch, and it was a big boost for the NHL. Speaking in 1975, C.R. Hamilton, the sales director of the St. Lawrence Starch Company, he observed that though the hockey picture, or through the hockey picture promotion, 
uh, our radio advertising with Wesley Night Sports Views and interviews, newspaper advertising, and so on, much good publicity was generated for the NHL at a time when arenas were not being filled as they are today or have been in recent years. Thus, it was agreed by the NHL league and team officials of those early years that our promotion played no small part in starting the NHL off to the eminence it eventually reached. Hamilton's words reflect some pretty well-founded pride. So as I said earlier, the promotion ran for 35 years, which is an unprecedented time period. Within five years of starting, it had quadrupled sales volume and vaulted the Beehive brand into the market leadership over Canada Starch. And it was a position that it uh, maintained for the duration of the promotion. Arguably, it was the most successful consumer promotion in Canadian business history. So in concluding our look at uh, the Beehive promotion and its impact, we'll look to uh, uh, close with a statement from another SIR member and author, Andrew Podnix. In his book, A Canadian Saturday Night, Andrew noted that today you can go online and download a color game action photo of any player in the world. But back then, Beehive was your one and only Google for hockey images. Once you had the cards, you could look at them while you listen to Foster call the game. And by doing so, you got a fuller sense of what your hero looked like while he played. It allowed one medium, photography, to dovetail with another, radio, to create in the mind's eye, a kind of personal television. There was a beauty and an imagination in that inner collaboration that we no longer have. And I think Andrew stated it pretty successfully. In the brief time that we've had available, we've introduced, we provided an introduction to the Beehive Golden Corn Syrup Hockey Picture Promotion, and we could go on in much greater detail. We do in our book, it's a 300 page uh, epic, the, uh, called The Golden Years. Uh, in it, we've analyzed the promotion season by season in as broad a means as possible. We've included a copy of every picture, all 1,025 issued during the promotion including ones that were never listed, but nevertheless made their way from St. Lawrence starch to consumers. We also looked at competitive activity, activity from companies such as Canada Starch, Quaker Oats, Opeachy, Parkers, and Czech Cereal, as well as the ancillary promotions that St. Lawrence Starch ran, their redemption tokens, their packaging, and their advertising material. Anyone interested in learning more is encouraged to go to our website, beehivegoldenyears.com. And uh, on that site, you'll get further details about the book, see what the inside looks like, and details on how to order it. And I would point out that in response to what's become a very common question, the book is only available from us, that's Aubrey and Don, and not through the conventional bricks and mortar uh, bookstores or any online retailers. So thanks very much for your time and your attention. Thank you, Aubrey. Uh, good that you uh, mentioned about the book and its availability. So uh, everybody's getting this, the, your website underway. Um, I have one question to start us. What is the most valuable beehive card or photo? The that's, highest that's value if I went, went you, to buy it. Are you there, Don? Do you want to take it? Sounds like Don's uh, internet isn't working. Uh, it would seem that the most valuable is uh, either Jerry Brown or Cy Wentworth. Um, there's a dealer in Oshawa that has them, and he's asking $10,000 a piece, although I might point out that he's had them for a number of years. So um, th those would seem to be the most exclusive, and it, it um, reflects the fact that uh, with Beehive Pictures, because you could specify the player you wanted, the stars are much less valuable than the players like uh, Jerry Brown who came up for part of two seasons or, or Cy Wentworth, which wasn't exactly a household name. He wasn't a big star and uh, therefore wouldn't have had his picture uh, requested as many times, uh, especially uh, when he moved over to the, uh, the Canadians. Good, thank you, Aubrey. They, that was one of the questions that came up and uh, we had someone responded to it. Uh, Bill Williams wondered, 
did you request a specific player or would they just send you a random photo? And uh, John Eddy responded, do you want to comment on that again, uh, Aubrey? Yeah, just, you, you did definitely uh, uh, request the player that you wanted. And if they were out of stock in that player, 